All right, let's open up our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll be looking at verses 27 through 29. We'll be uh, continuing with Moses and his actions and works and life of faith uh, that we started last Sunday morning. We talked a little bit about it last Sunday night, and we'll cover it this morning and then tonight as well. And then next week we'll get into uh, the people at the walls of Jericho. But when you get there, please stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word. And as, as it is when you're preaching through the book of the Bible, there's going to be some repetition. So some things that you heard uh, last week, you'll hear today. But uh, as I keep looking at, at these scriptures and, and where we finished up in Acts and we're starting in Romans uh, on Wednesday nights, uh, there's a lot of things that God, I think, keeps reminding me of. And, you know, I think it's just as much for me as it is for anybody else who hears the teaching on it. But uh, don't, don't sit there and say, well, he said that last week. Well, maybe it's because we need to hear it again. So Hebrews chapter 11, verses 27 through 29. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, assaying to do, were drowned. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you again this morning. Lord, we can't come to you enough and, and pray for your guidance and, and your help and your comfort, your joy, your peace, your conviction. And Lord, I'm, I'm just thankful and humbled this morning by the grace and mercy that you show me every day. And I pray everybody else here has that same thankfulness, has that same humility in their heart. Lord, I pray that as I try to give this message this morning, I pray that it would be what you would have said, that remove myself, my thoughts, my feelings out of the way, but let them be your thoughts, your desires, your feelings. Lord, I don't want to say anything of my own because I'm sinful. I'm a wretch. There's, as Paul said, that there's nothing in me, there's no good thing. But Lord, let it be what comes from the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask all this in your son's precious, holy, and wonderful name. Amen. So as I said, we started... Last week, looking at how Moses lived a life of faith. And that faith, as we see in verse 23, started with his parents. His parents, Amram and Jochebed. They hid him for three months. They didn't want to obey the Pharaoh. They didn't want to put him to death. And so they hid him for three months, and then they put him in a basket or an ark of bulrushes and sealed it with tar and with pitch. And, and I think it's... Kind of neat, it's the same thing that Noah sealed the ark with. She sealed it with these things and placed him in the Nile while the Pharaoh's daughter was there bathing. And maybe she knew a little bit about Pharaoh's daughter. Maybe she'd be sympathetic. Maybe she'd be compassionate when she heard this baby crying. But essentially what she did, what Jochebed did, was give Moses up. And as she gave him up, we know that she received him back. Again, because as Miriam, Moses' sister, is watching what's going on, wanting to see what happened with the baby, Pharaoh's daughter finds him, and she says, well, this is a Hebrew baby. And Miriam said, you want me to go find somebody to nurse him for you? And she did, because she just happened to know her mama would be able to nurse. And so Jochebed received him back, was able to raise him for a time, teaching him the traditions of their fathers teaching them about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he was raised by his parents until probably he was around 12 and then turned back over to Pharaoh's daughter. But then he enjoyed all the pleasures of living as a prince in Egypt. He had access to all the wealth. He had access to all the vices. And he had access to the greatest education in the world at the time. As we talked about this last Sunday night in the book of Acts, in chapter 7, verse 22, in Stephen's sermon, he says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. I mean, the Egyptians were smart. I mean, I, I've, I've talked to people 
and, and this there's some weird theories, but there was a man I used to work with, and we'd talk about the existence of God. And he would say, he believed this, mind you, that life was put here on earth by aliens. I said, what makes you think that? He said, well, look at the pyramids, how precise they are, and, and, and how... Just they've got them, you know, latitude and longitude are at certain points and they're perfectly north, south, east, and west and all these things. They had to be something other than humans. I was like, no. I said, the Egyptians had the greatest education in the world at the time and they had some of the smartest people building their pyramids, which was the Hebrews. And, and so the education back then was paramount compared to the rest of the world. And then... Last week, last Sunday night, I mentioned you look at the time of Christ, Egypt and Alexandria, Egypt, after the time of Christ came the educational hub of the world. You know, a lot of church fathers or a lot of philosophers studied in Alexandria, Egypt. But in Egypt, it said, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. There was nothing that Moses didn't have access to. Being in the royal household, being basically the grandson of Pharaoh. And have you ever seen even what they buried some of these pharaohs with or even other people in Egypt? There's all kinds of gold and, and things like that and things that equal material wealth. But when Moses was 40 years old, we're told that he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter anymore. And so back in Acts 7, 23, it says, When he was full 40 years old, this is Stephen's sermon again, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. See, Moses knew who he was. He knew he was a Hebrew. He knew he was an Israelite. And so he goes and he goes to see uh, his, his brethren, the children of Israel. And in Exodus, it says he looked upon their burden. Him knowing who he was, knowing who they were, knowing the traditions, knowing how they got to Egypt, knowing the, the glorifying works of God up to the point, how God used Egypt to preserve his family and his loved ones. He knew all those stories, but here he goes. He's lo looking at the people of God, God's chosen people, and they're slaves, subjected to bondage. His people subjected to bondage. And so he saw a Hebrew getting beat by an Egyptian. He didn't like it. And it says he slew the Egyptian. In Acts 7, 25, it says, For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And so what this says, at this time, Moses had an idea that he would be a deliverer in Egypt. But it said at this time that he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So God, in some shape, form, or fashion, had told Moses that he would deliver the people of Israel. He just probably didn't tell them what time. And I think God had showed him this. He didn't know when or how he would do it. And we see back in Hebrews in verse 26, in chapter 11, it says, Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And so when we look at uh, what that means there in Christ, and I talked about this last Sunday night, it probably means just the fact that the reproach of him being the deliverer of Israel. Because Christ in the Greek was Christos, which means anointed one, and there's other times it's used by other people than Jesus. It just depends on whether it's a big C or little C. And so he was the anointed deliverer of the Israelites in Egypt. And he thought the reproach that came with that was worth more than anything he could gain as a prince of Egypt. Again, he had access to everything. He had access to all the wealth, all the women, all the vices, all the pleasures of sin as Melinda talked about. He had access to every bit of it. But the reproach of being called by God and following in that calling was worth more than anything he could gain by continuing to live that life. And so it says in verse 26, he looked or he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And it says something similar in verse 27, 
where it says, He endured as seeing Him who is invisible by looking to God. And that's what we see all throughout Hebrews 11. Talk about Abraham who's looking for a city, whose builder and maker is God. He didn't see these promises, but looked for them afar off. You know, looking at things outside of what we uh, can perceive with our physical eyes. Because, again, what we perceive with our physical eyes is temporary. But what they were looking to was eternal. And so looking at the purpose of Hebrews 11 is to show us examples of faith. And back in 11.1, 1, it tells us what faith is. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so often when we think of faith, we think of looking to something. Looking to God. And again, it's those things that, you know, we look to God other people around us may not see what we're looking to. We've got to look through the eyes of faith because they only see what's here, what's temporal. But yet we're looking to what's eternal. But just as important in faith of what we look to, what we continually see, especially in Hebrews 11, is what we leave behind, what we forsake, what we count as loss. Because we've already talked about Moses. He left the life of the palace to go be with slaves. To go with a, be with a subjected people. He had it all. Yet he chose to be with his people who were in bondage. And in verse 27 it says, By faith he forsook Egypt. He left Egypt altogether. He had slain the Egyptian and he was rebuked by his own people rejected by his own people. Because it says, you know, he thought that they would, you know, understand that God had called them to deliver him. But when the next day after he killed the Egyptian, he tried to break up two, uh, two Israelites that were fighting. And they said, who made you a judge and a ruler over us? Who are you? You're an Egyptian. You're not, you're not part of us. And so Moses was rejected. And it says, by faith he forsook Egypt. Now, when you look at Exodus 2.15, the original story, it says this. It says, now when Pharaoh heard this thing, talking about him slaying the Egyptian, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. And so that makes it sound like he's leaving because he's scared of Pharaoh. Because it says, when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from his face. But then in Hebrews eleven twenty seven, it says, not fearing the wrath of the king. So I'm thinking, okay, how do we reconcile that? What does that mean? Well, going back to Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, verses 27 through 29, it says, but he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, thrust Moses away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? And then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. So as soon as he was rejected by the Egyptians, it says he left. And so when we look back at Exodus, when Pharaoh heard of it, by that time, Moses was already gone. But it shows that Moses left in faith. Did God tell him to leave? I guess so. I think so. But he left because it says that by faith he forsook Egypt. He left it completely behind. And again, it wasn't time for Moses to deliver Israel. I don't think he was ready yet. You, you think about where he was just coming from and the position of power that he had. He probably was pretty prideful and lifted up. I'm a prince of Egypt. I can come and deliver these people. I can tell Pharaoh what I, what I want to tell him and, and have these people delivered. But it wasn't time yet. And Moses at that point wasn't humble enough. And so God had him leave Egypt and for 40 years he dwelt in Midian. He gathered a wife. He had two sons born to him and lived as a shepherd in his father-in-law's household. To me, that sounds like a pretty humbling experience. Going from a prince in Egypt, access to any type of wealth he wanted, to a shepherd in the land of Midian. 
And so for 40 years, he, he was humbled and trained by God. And when it says he forsook Egypt, what that means in the Greeks, it means not to just leave, but it means to leave behind, to abandon, to count it as loss, as we've talked about <coughs> Paul says. And so he left Egypt, he left that life behind, and it's used similarly in Luke chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. He says, after these things, it's talking about Jesus, he went forth and he saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And so Levi here that is talking about is Matthew, the tax collector. He was rich. He was like Zacchaeus. He had all kinds of money. And some of it was honest, some of it was dishonest. A lot of it was dishonest. He had made himself rich collecting taxes. But when Jesus Christ comes to him, he says, hey, follow me. And he says he left all. He forsook all to follow Jesus. He left it behind. All the riches that he could think of, all the things that he could gather, he left it behind. And so Moses, in forsaking Egypt, left all that any man could want as far as the worldly things go. I mean, there's a lot of men that work their whole lives and never attain to the level of access to wealth as Moses had. And some people, it drives people crazy. I mean, that, they, they work, they work, they work for what? Money. And they have enough. There is nobody in here that does not have enough. But yet we want more and more and more. And Moses left every bit of it. And he counted it as loss. Again, as Philippians 3, 8 says, and we've hit this verse several times on Sundays and Wednesdays, but Paul says, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And so like Paul, Moses actively counted it as loss. And it wasn't like he was handed a raw deal, that something was taken away from him, or just his lot in life was not good. He left it. He gave it up. It wasn't nothing, well, this was taken away from me. No, he gave it away. He said, take it. I don't want it. He didn't lose it. He left it. And we look at our society today. We look at the church. What do we forsake? What do we leave? What do we sacrifice to serve Jesus Christ? What do we sacrifice to be here on Sunday morning? What do we sacrifice to come on Sunday night or Wednesday night? And too many of us, one of the most flexible things in our life is our fellowship with other saints. And so we're, we're not flexible if in our jobs. No, I've got to be there. But yet when it comes to church, whether it's Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, well, this come up or this come up, and, and we leave it. Now, granted, there's things that happen. There's emergencies that happen. But again, a lot of the, the most flexible thing in our lives a lot of times is our church. And we easily forsake it for something else. I mean, I know folks that they will not go to church on a Sunday that the Titans are playing at home because they go to the Titans game. You tell me what's number one in their life. What do we forsake? What do we give up for Christ? And, and if, we, if we sat here and, and made a list on what we've forsaken, what we've left, what we've given up to serve Christ, I'm afraid that it'd be a small list. As I was in Arkansas a few weeks ago and I was preaching there, it was Luke 14 that I preached on. And if, you, if I don't tell people, hey, gee, this is what Jesus said. If, if I tell people, I say, you know what? If you don't forsake everything that you have, you can't follow Jesus. People would tell me, well, that's being very restrictive. That's legalistic. That's very, very much like the Pharisees. That, that's, you can't do that. 
But here's the thing. Jesus Christ is the one who said it. If you don't forsake all that you have, you cannot follow me. But too often we're like the people that Jesus goes to and he says, follow me. And we're like, well, let me do this first and do this first and do this first. Then I'll follow you. And Jesus says, no, I don't want none of it. I'm not second. Jesus says, if you don't hate your father and mother. He said, anybody that loves father and mother more than me cannot be my disciple. And those are harsh words. But yet, we won't forsake those things. We won't put Jesus Christ first in our life. He's lower on down the list. He's the most flexible part of our life. Well, I can put Jesus aside. And I'll just be honest. The way I see it in some people, I don't see how they do it. Because I lay down at night, and I'm, going th I'm thinking throughout the day, and I'm asking God, forgive me for watching TV when I should have been reading, when I should have been studying. Forgive me for doing this when I should have been doing that. And, and I get convicted over it. I said, Lord, forgive me for my, my slothfulness, my laziness, my idolatry of putting things before serving your son Jesus Christ. And I see people that it seems not to bother whatsoever. And that worries me. That troubles me. Because we are too easily forsaking Jesus Christ for everything else instead of forsaking everything else for Christ. But he forsook Egypt. Moses did. And in that 40 years in, in Midian, it says he endured. In verse 27, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And so in that 40 years in Midian, and, and you got to remember the account in Exodus skips from Moses leaving Egypt to going to Midian, and then basically the next thing we see is where God comes to him at the burning bush. So for 40 years, it says he persevered as seeing him, seeing him who is invisible. He still knew of God. And I think he was looking to God in that time. Because like I said last week, when God in the burning bush said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses knew who he was. Because he said he feared. And he bowed his head because he knew he couldn't look upon God. But he had forsaken Egypt. And from that time on, Moses was keeping something. And, and I'm, not, I'm not big on... on I don't put a whole lot of thought in my titles on my sermons, but this week it was the faith of forsaking and keeping. To be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, there's some things that we've got to leave behind and there's some things that we've got to grab onto, that we've got to hold on to. And so he returned, he kept the call of God, and he obeyed God. And a lot of times, often, what we're asked to do in faith makes absolutely no sense to us. Absolutely no sense. But what do we do? We humble ourselves and we say, God, you know better than I do. Because too often, a lot of times we may say, well, God, I don't, I don't think this is right. But what does Proverbs say? The ways that are right in a man's eyes, what do they lead to? Death. So often what we... What God asks us to do in faith, they make no sense or, or, they, or they seem impossible. And, and I'm, always, I'm always thinking about Naaman. You know, he, he was a leper, he was a general in Syria, and he goes to Elisha, and Elisha don't, don't even hardly talk to him. He says, go wash in the Jordan seven times. Simple, right? But it made no sense to Naaman. Naaman gruffed up at it. And he said, we got... All kinds of better water in Syria, in Damascus. Why should I go dump myself in that dirty Jordan River? And his people said, Hey, if he had asked you to do some great thing, like, you know, if he had asked you to try to jump off a building, you'd have done it to be healed of your leprosy. But he just asked you to do something simple. Even though it doesn't make sense, do it. And so Naaman did, and he was cleansed of his lepers. Kind of like when Peter and some of the other disciples were fishing. They fished all night and Jesus is on the shore. He tells, hey, cast on the other side. 
That made absolutely no sense to God. Hey, we fished all night. Nothing is biting. Cast on the other side. And they did. And they about tore the nets with all the fish that they caught. And so sometimes it's hard. It doesn't, pay, it doesn't make sense what God asks us to do. And the same thing he is here in Hebrews 11, 28 and 29. And, and we'll talk about 28 this morning, 29 tonight. But it says, Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And of course, verse 29 talks about passing through the Red Sea. And, and looking at the things that they were told to do in faith, put blood on the doorpost, you'll be saved. Now, when we think about that, to me, in our fleshly mind, that wouldn't make any sense. How are we going to be saved from dying by putting blood on the doorpost? Or then, when you look at them at the, at the Red Sea, they're stopped at the Red Sea. They see the Egyptians come, and they've got two choices. They either try to swim or surrender. And most likely, either one of them would end in death. But God tells them to do the thing that they had no inkling to do, which was stand still. Stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. Now, to me, if I'm thinking of that in an earthly way, none of it makes sense. But God asked him to do it in faith. And so looking at the Passover, the Passover became one of the most focal points of the Jewish person's life in the Old Testament. Everything started with the Passover. So in Exodus chapter 12, and I'm going to read several verses here, but just to kind of give us an idea uh, of the Passover. And you've got to remember up to this point, there was nine plagues, Okay. There was the frogs, and there was the flies, and the, the water had turned to blood, and I can't do the exact order of everything, but everything was leading up to this moment because everything that had happened, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not let God's people go. And so finally in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, he says, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. And so this is the start of the Hebrew calendar right here with Passover. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make... Your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. They shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. So you eat this lamb, and you take the blood, and you rub it on the doorpost again. Do you think that made sense to the Israelites, that that would protect them? I don't, I don't, I, I, don't, uh, I don't foresee them being too energetic about, hey, let's put this blood on the doorpost. I see them putting it on the doorpost. It's like, I don't know how in the world this is going to work. But yet, by faith, they did it. Verses 11 through 14 in Exodus 12 says, And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. You shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And so one thing they had to do when they ate it, 
They had to have their shoes on their feet, their loins had to be girded, their staff in their hand, and they shall eat in haste. Why? Because they was going to have to leave. And so they had faith in that God was going to deliver them because God said, hey, put your clothes on. Don't recline too much when you're eating this because you're going to have to leave first thing in the morning. I promise you. And so they put their clothes on, they girded their loins, they had the shoes on, and they did that in faith. And then in verses 21, and this kind of repeats what we've read, but it says, Then Moses called for the elders of Israel, said unto them, Draw out, take you a lamb according to your families, kill the Passover. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel, and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door, will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. It shall come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he hath promised that ye shall keep this service. It shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? that ye shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed their head and worshiped and the children of Israel went away, did as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And so what we see in those verses, it was already put in as a permanent institution. He says you do this forever. When your children asked what this means, you tell them that God delivered us from bondage in Egypt. But putting the blood on the doorpost would be what would save them. And again, I don't think that made a whole lot of sense, but they did it by faith. And by faith, that blood saved them. There's a quote that I come across pretty regular. And every time I see this quote, it makes me stop. It makes me listen. It makes me pay attention. But it's talking about the Passover. And especially what it means for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ. But it says, The Lord did not check who inside the house was worthy. He checked for the blood on the doorposts. None of us are worthy. Only the blood of Jesus covers us. None of us are worthy but the blood of Jesus covers us. By faith, they trusted that Jesus, or they trusted that God would see the blood and pass them over. By faith, we see or believe that God sees the blood of Jesus Christ over our life and he saves us. He passes over us. That blood would represent the shed blood of Christ 1,400 years later. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 It says, Purge ye out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And so it's talking about the leaven there and the leaven in this, instance, in this situation is the world and the sin that comes from the world, the sin that we think is pleasurable for a time. But he's saying forsake it. Get it out of your life. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. And so you hold on to those things that he promises you. It says, neither with the leaven of malice or wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and and truth, and we hold on to the sincerity and truth that is in Jesus Christ. We forsake the world, we forsake the sin, and we hold on to Christ. Like Moses forsook Egypt and all the bondage, all the sin that was tied to it, we, for, we do the same. We forsake the sin, we forsake the world, and we grab on to Jesus Christ, and, and we keep His commandments. John 14, 15 said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And so as a Christian, there are things that we're told to leave. And just like a husband and wife, there are things we're told to cleave. 
says a husband is to leave his mother and father and cleave to his spouse. We are to leave the world and cleave to Christ because we are Christ's bride if we're born again, if we're his. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you and praise you again this morning for the opportunity we've had to gather together. And I just pray that we'll say it.